In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Christ is in our midst. From the very beginning of the Christian faith, after Christ rose from the waters of the Jordan and returned from his time in the desert, he began preaching. He began preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We know that in Greek this word repent means to change your mind. It's a call not necessarily that we normally think of when we think of repentance, which carries with it the sense of guilt and shame. But it's a call for us to rise above where we currently are, to change our actions and to become who God truly intended us to be. In this way, it's not a negative thing, and repentance is not something shameful, but it's the very essence of the gospel. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change your mind. Rise up to the station that God has called you. Become who you truly are meant to be. Take away all those things that keep you from God and keep you from your neighbor. And so this gospel and this message is inherently countercultural. Christ from the very beginning preach this message first and foremost to and among the Pharisees. We see time and time again that he has conflict with the Pharisees and that he is calling them to rise to a better station than the way in which they are currently living. And he calls those people around them not to fall prey to the culture that the Pharisees are developing, but to rise above it to where God has truly called them to be. He says, I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. He's saying you must go beyond just what they tell you, just what the popular and the leaders of this time period tell you. Christ himself was crucified for this countercultural message that we are to rise above the pervading winds of the day. Moving on from there, as the church established itself, it continued this countercultural message against the paganism of the Roman Empire. When the Roman elites sought to quell the Christians, they asked them to sacrifice to idols, to participate and do what everybody else is doing. Just follow along and show that you're a good citizen. But the Christians wouldn't. They knew that sacrificing to the idols, sacrificing to the emperor and treating him as a god was a betrayal of Jesus Christ. And so they continued to function counter to the pervading winds of the political and cultural moment. But what happens when the church becomes the institution? What happens when the church becomes the pervading winds? Well, It's after Constantine legalizes Christianity and the Orthodox Church rises among the Roman elite and receives its standing that monasticism finds its place within the church. And this movement is again for the sole purpose of calling us to repent and calling the church, even the church itself, when it has become the institution and has gone after the ways of the world and followed after the current cultural moments political winds, even the church itself needs to be called to repentance. And last week, we celebrated St. Anthony the Great, who was one of the first to do this, to leave the community and go out into the wilderness so that those people who would look at his life would say, that is something different. And they would follow him and listen to him preach and realize that although they were Christian and part of the church, they still needed to do more. God was still calling them to something greater. And that perhaps even in this early days, when the church is gaining its footing, it had made strange bedfellows with the Roman Empire. But this movement of monasticism is not the only way in which the church itself has been called to repent. It's not the only countercultural movement that is focused on those in the church and calling the church itself to repentance. There is another and more unique and less well-known variety of this countercultural expression of the gospel, and those are people called the fools for Christ. 
fools for Christ are people who voluntarily and willingly take on the air of a crazy person almost, doing things that make no sense, doing things that are strange and weird for the purpose of calling people to repent, to be set apart from the rest of the institutional church so that people will look at them and learn the ways in which they are to rise above their current way of life. Today, we celebrate one of those saints, one of those fools for Christ, St. Ksenia of St. Petersburg. And if you look on the icons in the upper, the upper row, the second from the end on the back wall is St. Ksenia wearing a green military garb. She lived in St. Petersburg in the, in the 18th century, and she was the wife of a military commander in the, Roman, or in the Russian Empire. Her husband, however, was killed when she was just 26 and she was, was left as a widow with no children, but a substantial holding because they were of high society. St. Ksenia used this opportunity to call the world to repentance. She adopted the life of a holy fool. A holy fool, like I said, takes on the air of something crazy in order to call us to repentance. So she started wearing her husband's military uniform and she sold everything that she had and she gave it to the poor. Her family thought that she had had some, some type of mental break after her husband had passed. But she was in, in fact very sane and making all these choices very consciously. So as I said, she sold everything and then she went to live in the streets among the poor. And every time she received alms, she would take what she received and she would give it to those poorer than her, which is hard to find because she had nothing. She continued to walk around the city dressed as her husband, speaking as if she were her husband and only answering to his name. Again, this strange behavior left the people of St. Petersburg confused. Here was this woman, formerly of high society, who's now wearing her husband's military clothes and pretending that she's him. You can imagine that the members of her social class began to look down on her. But even the lower classes, the middle and the low classes, because of her voluntary poverty, thought that she was crazy. And she bore their ridicule and people would lambast her and chide her and say all kind of evil and false things and she bore it quietly. Then over time, people began to realize that the alms that she gave to those people who were poor affected them more than just the financial giving that she could do. That as she gave to them, she would pray for them and then they would receive what she prayed for. And so even though she was this woman who was disheveled and lived in the streets and looked like a military officer as much as she could, people came to her for her prayers. Still affecting this air of wild craziness, she would pray for them in private, in secret. And they would receive whatever she prayed for and whatever they asked. And then those people would come back to her and give her money as thanks. And she would take it and give it to the poor again. The people of St. Petersburg were amazed by again, what we might consider her foolishness as every night she would go into the quarry and grab stones and bring them to the construction site of a church. And perhaps almost single-handedly built a church in the city of St. Petersburg under the cover of darkness. Again, people looking out their windows and seeing this now aged woman in an old tattered military garb carrying stones around the city. But her foolish action caused people to take notice of her. And because they took notice of her, they received her prayers. And because they received her prayers, they received the blessing of God. I bring her up today, although she's 
not well-known because her prayers are special. And her prayers especially are entreated for those who are looking for employment. And given the COVID-19 pandemic and the effect that it's had on the economy, although she's the third or fourth saint that we celebrate today, and low on the list and not well known, we need to once again look at her like the people of St. Petersburg did. And look at her foolishness, and look at the way that she conducted her life and understand that in this person there is someone special. And for those of us who are struggling with our employment, either to make ends meet or struggling to find new employment, St. Ksenia of St. Petersburg is here for you. Offer your prayers and ask her to join you in the same way that she did with all those people on the streets of St. Petersburg. And although she is foolish and crazy, she's not really. She just did that to call our attention to her. And so many of us are struggling financially these times. St. Ksenia will intercede for you and with you. I pray that we consider the foolishness of Christ's gospel, that we are called to live a life that the world around us, much like St. Ksenia, deems foolish and strange. Even St. Paul himself, when he lays out just the way in which St. Ksenia will live, says, the message of the cross is foolishness. It pleased God through foolishness of the message preached to save those who believed. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, the base things of the world and the things which are despised. God has chosen. St. Senya was despised by those around her, by those in the world. She was put to shame as people made fun of her and criticized her. But she chose all of this to live out these words of St. Paul. That the things that we might deem foolish, God deems wise. And the things that we might deem as weak, like a frail old woman, might be strong enough to build up and sustain a church. And so as we live our lives and embrace the foolishness of the gospel, forgiveness instead of justice, love instead of hatred, sacrifice and struggle instead of self-fulfillment, self-denial in the age of self-gratification, we remember St. Ksenia. And as we struggle against the coronavirus and the impact it's had not just on health but on our economy, both national, international, and personal, I pray that this great fool through her actions, might call our attention to her. And that as we pray for our families, for our well-being, and for our future stability, that we turn to St. Ksenia and have her prayers. Amen. <laughs>